big brother, he shocked the nation. He was virgin territory to me. He was one of the most extraordinary human beings I've ever met. His outrageous image and acid tongue divided viewers and fellow housemates alike. He's more outrageous than anybody. He's got the most wicked gob in the world. I wouldn't piss on her if she burst into flames. Love him or hate him, this larger-than-life electro-pop maestro was back with a vengeance. We love freaks, we love weirdos, we love eccentrics, and Pete Burns is probably the number one at the moment. After a long period out of the public eye, Pete's appearance on Celebrity Big Brother was a triumph that looked set to relaunch his career. It was his freak status that put him back in the public consciousness. But weeks after the programme ended, Pete Burns would find himself facing a very different reality. Prison. In January 2006, Pete Burns emerged from reality TV's biggest goldfish bowl as a star reborn. Pete's image was everywhere. You know, this guy had the world at his fingertips. Everybody wanted Pete Burns. But what happened next turned his life into a nightmare. Hello, is that the bail office prisoner management unit? It's June 2006, and Pete's management are trying to get him out of prison. Yeah, hello. I'm just trying to um, find out about the release of, of Mr. Pete Burns. Just weeks after Big Brother ended, Pete was arrested and charged with harassment after incidences involving his boyfriend, Michael. And after breaking the conditions of his bail, he was re-arrested and sent to jail. We need to find out what police station George Galloway is signing the assurity release form in. Is that where he is? is, is 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 in Cuba, is he? Oh, good luck. All right. With new bail conditions having been set, George Galloway, Pete's former housemate, has agreed to put up the money. Only problem is, he's out of the country. The team need to find someone else. Because we've called the bail office. Just say, look, someone else would have put that bail money up, Wendy. You know, and we just want to get him out. Pete, there's got to be somebody you can tell. Right, you tell them that you want everything... Listen, nobody can do anything at the moment because we're just waiting for Galloway's mob to, to sign. You can't speak to them. They're all away. They're out of the country, Pete. With George Galloway out of the picture, bail eventually arrives from an unlikely source. we got another person who is willing to put up bail. Yeah, I know. I'm going to see if I can find anything on Google about this guy in Plymouth. He's an author, right. The day of Pete's release finally arrives, and Teresa is on her way to the prison. It's been very difficult, I think, for everybody concerned to follow the thread of the whole story because it's become so complicated. After coming out of Big Brother, he's been trying to sell his house. He'd just returned from Italy after living over there for two years. He'd had the ongoing surgery. I mean, things kind of started to run a little bit out of control for Pete. Pete's £3,000 bail has been paid by a fan, a fan that no one, including Pete, has ever met. But as part of the conditions, he must go and live at this person's house in Plymouth. So Pete's bandmate Steve is there to take him. I spoke to Pete Benz this afternoon. He's perfectly fine, perfectly calm, and can't understand why he's incarcerated in Wandsworth prison. I just want a mouse. After two months inside, Pete is finally released and straight on the phone to his solicitor. Yeah, but you weren't exactly working quickly and efficiently, were you? And it actually comes as quite a horrendous shock to me that I'm auctioned off like a sacred pig to somebody that I've never met when there were other people put in place to meet these bail conditions. I've never met this Peter Quint. He could be a fucking serial killer, couldn't he? Pete is banned from London, so he'll have to stay at the fans' house until his next court appearance. This could be anyone. If someone had put more bail up, I'd be going to their house. I was on the market, wasn't I? It's a real shock once you go through the prison system. You go through, I mean, the bit you've seen, I could have laughed in your face. I mean, that is luxury compared to a cockroach-ridden cell with a toilet that won't flush. Yeah. I can honestly say once you're behind the closed doors, it's the nearest thing to what you visualise a Thai prison to be. Despite prior arrests for incidents involving boyfriend Michael, the two are still together. Hi, Schnobs, how are you? Well, I'm wearing pyjama trousers and an old lady's sweater, and I'm rancid. <laughs> I look worse than 
Diana Ross did after her arrest. The only thing that gets me through is she looked like Don King. The only information Pete has about the mysterious fan is from the letters he sent him in prison. Of course I think it's surreal. I think the whole situation is surreal and he's just another byproduct of that. I get this sort of fan mail, I get these books, I get this money. He made the best offers, he'd have put anything down to get me out of that jail. By all those letters, they're unfucking believable. With each cigarette I light, he's gonna lick between my legs. I'll be red raw, and then I smoke. With but you must understand, at no point have I met or even seen Mr. Quint. And I kept asking him to send me a photo, and he refused, so he's a completely mysterious character. And we're both dying to meet him. And he's got a nice Chianti with some father beans waiting for us. He's going to eat my liver. <laughs> Clarice. It is Clarice Cliff, isn't it? What have I done to deserve this? You know, I should have done a murder. Coming up... Pete finds out how much his fan really likes him. That's my bridal veil. He bought me this. <laughs> 80s icon Pete Burns has just been released from prison, having served two months for breaking bail. He has been released on the condition that he stays in Plymouth with the mysterious fan who bailed him out. No one, including Pete, has ever met this man. Mr. Quint. It's midnight in Plymouth, outside of the fan's house. Mr. Quint. You've probably poked my eye out. This is like story. Oh, help. <laughs> Mr. Quint. <laughs> oh, God, I'm going to go back to jail. After all I've achieved, I've come to this. I fully appreciate this man's generosity. But this is a bit like trying to keep a tropical fish in a lavatory bowl. Mr. I'm definitely concerned, especially as he's not here. Mr. Quint. I just want to go home to my London house. With Pete's new housemate missing in action, he has to check in at the local police station. Don't worry, we won't offend. Okay. But is there any way of checking that if he's... Because I'm kind of worried by the tone of his letters that he's topped himself. Well, we're well, concerned, because this was his life ambition, to have me come down and stay with him. And yeah. We'll check tomorrow. Why do I always get the arse end of things? Don't tell me nothing's wrong. I've simply got two. Don't bring around a cloud, my parade. The train station waiting for you. We went to the train station, so I'm fine. Word comes through that the fan is waiting at the train station, but Pete's in no rush to meet him. He's dead. He's at the train station. Stew. We're going to a hotel. I need a bath. It's the next morning, and Pete's finally going to meet his fan. This is like everything I ever ran away from as a child. This is God definitely punishing me. Oh, the 80s bar. Maybe I can go and do a revival of my glittering career in the 80s bar. The reality of it sinking in, isn't it? I feel like I've got a date with destiny. He thinks he's bought me. You know, you know, I'm very intuitive about people, and he thinks he's paid three thousand pounds for my bail, and he's bought me, and I've got to be there when he says, and he's my jailer with the velvet key, and he can go and shove it in his ass. <laughs> you who? He's run away. <laughs> fucking kill me, you will. Why'll I kill you? Fucking kill me. Why will I kill you? Fucking kill me, you will. Oh, don't be so dramatic. You'll dramatic. fucking kill me. Why? I'm not, I'm not dramatizing. You're. Oh, I see we're being filmed. Everything I do is filmed, honey. Everything I do is filmed. Why will I kill you? First of all, thank you. And I can't believe where I am. You'll fucking kill me. Oh, shut up. Why'll I kill you? Hi, you. Hi, you erotic old queen. Why'll I kill you? What's happened to the police gonna arrest you? Take a tablet. That won't work. What? That won't work. I'll oh, take two tablets. Oh, come on. Work, okay. Take five tablets. Just to meet you. That's my bridal veil. He went to college.
Covent Garden. Come on, look, okay? I'll take five tablets. Please meet you. That's my bridal veil. He went to Covent Garden and bought me this. It cost four fifty. There's fifty letters that he hasn't yet sent me. Here are my gifts. How can this be? How can this be? I just really don't know. I'm not afraid of anything, but it's potentially frightening. Do you know Misery, the movie Misery? It's kind of like that, isn't it? I can see me strapped to a bed with two broken feet. I can take the next album. Peter, I'm in shock. Don't say a word. No, I've got to say a word. I've got to say a word. Don't say a word. I've got to say a word. Oh, honey, get out of What else does matter? Nothing else matters. You're just so beautiful. I mean, now we're a bit alone, almost. What? I'd like to address you, but I don't know how to address you, OK? Pete, just address me as Pete. No, pe no, I can't. I can't. I call you Majesty, OK? It's good to call you Majesty because it makes me more composed and deliberate in what I say. I'm going to start calling you... Sire. OK, Sire. OK, Sire and Madge. Here we are. Why not? What's wrong with that? You're a queen, I'm a king. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Why be self-conscious? Why, why, why be so bloody fucking modest? So bloody fucking, OK. Why be so fucking modest? You're a queen, admit it. If I call you majesty, it's because you are. Isn't it? You're being punished for your extremity. Extremity of what? I lead a very quiet life. I've never been in trouble with the police before. The truth is this. Every fucking man in the country fancies you and wants to fuck somebody else's ass because he's upset by the fact that he fancies you. So you're being pilloried. You're being pilloried above all oh, for your beauty. For? You're being pilloried, first of all, for your beauty. First of all, for your beauty. You don't pillory people for the beauty. Why aren't oh, you pillorying she... Angelina Jolie? For a start, she's not beautiful. Hemingway says somewhere, if you are very brave, or very beautiful, or very clever. The world will try to kill you. Don't stop crying on camera. What's wrong with crying? Oh, because it makes your mascara run. Please read us a poem. Peter, please read us a poem. About you? Yeah, read one of them. Say, who's there? Strutting on down the street. Ain't she the one they call the gothic ruin? See, ain't that? The bride of Frankenstein come back? You see what she's wearing? That is plain obscene. That skirt was any shorter. You could kiss her anal sphincter, never mind her ass. The police ought to book her looking like that. What's she doing on our patch? She's just shameless. She's a mess, honey, is what she is. Hey, that's not a woman, don't you know? Besides, how can she give head with a kiss of that big? That's not a mouth, that's a suction pad. Head? She'd suck your face off. I feel as if somebody's disemboweling themselves in front of me, and I don't know whether to applaud or vomit. And people think I'm eccentric and nutty. Well, what I'm going to do is say my bowels have failed and shit all over the place so he gets me out of here. I wouldn't stay here for a full body lift. After a mad morning in Plymouth, Pete's eager to find a way to get back to London. Mr Quint, what's going to happen? He'll stab me 300 times, chop me up into little pieces, and keep the remainders of my cadaver in a pillowcase. I really don't know. Obviously, it's, it's great what he attempted to do, because nobody else came forward to get me out of the situation I was in. I was left in this a rock. I just don't know what to think of it, you know. I fell in love uh, without knowing this person. What else do you say? I mean, love. I mean, you'd do anything. You'd try and move a mountain to the person you love. Pete's need for surgery back in London provides him with the perfect excuse to get out of Plymouth. We've got to return to London on Friday so I get some medical treatment. Sorry, so you need 
Medical treatment on Friday. Yeah, I've got, I'm getting you know it cleared. One of your bail conditions, you've got to give 40. Yeah, that's what hours we're in the process notice. of doing. It's being done. Can I come with you? No. I have no objection to being in Plymouth, OK, but I certainly don't want to feel in a situation of any confinement whatsoever. You All of my belongings and my medications are at the hotel. I cannot stay in a strange environment. I need some solitude. I need a room of my own in this hotel. These are necessities for my actual mental stability because I have a lot of medications and dressings to apply to various wounds from my reconstructive surgery. I need to be in a hotel, in a bed alone, and I need to be in a bath. I need to get these things sorted. I need to do basic grooming, plucking, waxing. I need to get a black and decker on my vagina. Why are we talking about... I don't know what I'm talking about. I need to piss. No, no. Shall I show you the toilet? I'll find it. I'll go on an adventure. I'll probably find your dead mother strapped into a chair. Norman! Get that slut out of here! He's the most beautiful woman I ever met in my life. Pete's bail conditions forbid him from contacting anyone involved in the case, especially his boyfriend, Michael. Despite this, Michael heads to Plymouth. I've not seen him properly for months. You know, not outside of prison for about four, four months since before this whole period. So I'd like to see Pete, you know, away from London, just the two of us. Pete's decided that he can't stay at Quint's, so they meet at a local hotel. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi. I was working as a waiter when I first met Pete. You'd kind of see him come round the corner and it would be, wow, it, it, just this huge ball of colour and life, you know, that was Pete. I expected a bunch of flowers or a card to tell me how much that you'd missed me. One, one. Or a bar of chocolate. Were well, you not very giving in material things, are you? You just give your body willingly. <laughs> it's very odd when someone well-known is interested in you, you know, and it's that whole, which I'll suffer from probably for the rest of my life, scenario, pop star, waiter. He doesn't call me with material goods, really. You do sometimes, don't you, like crazy things like a graveyard statue. <laughs> you got a glitter on your nail. <laughs> I just want to be with Pete. I don't want my own show. I don't want to be in adverts. I don't want to record a song. I just want to go about my life as normally as I always have. And I always forget that because I'm with Pete, it somehow makes it different. Pete has been given special permission to return to London for medical reasons. With a long journey ahead, they stop at a local shop for snacks and ciggies. But it doesn't take long for Big Brother fans to spot him. It's a natural reaction from kids and stuff, you know. If they don't get some kind of interaction with them, then it turns from, hey, you're the celebrity, to, hey, you fucking faggot, or whatever, that's just normal. It's the big brother disease. The pressure from everybody is too much. The problem is, big brother made him a celebrity again. And, you know, probably a celebrity that Pete wants to be. The British public tormented me, they kept me in there like a, a laboratory rat. I had to keep the persona on, because that's what they wanted. To keep that persona on, I had a set amount of medications that I was abusing in copious amounts to keep myself revved up. He was very up and down. Uh, he went between Seventh Heaven and the psychiatrist's couch. After Big Brother, he went out on the scene I think this was, he was getting into the parties again. He's back on the showbiz scene in London. I think it all got a bit too much for Pete and he blew a bit of a gasket. He's caused quite a few problems in clubs that I work in, so I think he's regarded as a bit of a loose cannon and somebody that everybody wants to see, you know. They want him in his club because he looks so fabulous and he is eccentric and that's, you know, it's addictive.
to watch and to be around. They want him in his club because he looks so fabulous and he is eccentric and that's, you know, it's addictive to watch and to be around. They had some very, you know, crazy club people around me and they were trying to help me as best as they knew because they didn't know there was anything wrong. They just thought I was this fabulous, flamboyant, outrageous creature. The line between madness and brilliance sometimes is a very thin divide, but the best, it blurs, and it certainly blurs in Pete's case. During this dark phase, Pete went completely haywire, self-medicating, making false accusations about people looking a mess. His behavior was so erratic that he became a danger to himself and a danger to others. I slipped my lid, totally, and I should have been sectioned under the Mental Health Act if I wasn't willing to go for help myself. But no, I ended up in prison because people were just seeing the image thinking, oh, that's what somebody who looks like that behaves like. I don't know Michael was getting worried, and if he expressed any worry, I'd probably punch him in the eye. I mean, I had a knife at his throat, one incident, because he'd argued with me. I hit him several times because he would try and calm me down. I was in such a state of hysteria. And it's very painful to address these issues, but you know what? I'm not the only one who's dropped the baskets. But it's, it's a big one to swallow, that you had a big bipolar incident after your big break. And there were moments of lucidity in that period where I'd know I was ill and I'd want help, but there was no one there to help. God, I'm getting weepy on camera, stop. When did you go? To hell and back. Oh, don't stop. Does anybody really enjoy fame? I think it'd be a crazy person, more crazy than I went, that enjoyed fame. But you enjoy the things that can bring to you, but you give up so much. You do, you give up so much. I wish I'd never been so flamboyant. I wish I'd never had the need to be, you know, what I am. But it was a very real need. Coming up, Pete returns to London to face the court case that could see him back in jail. What am I supposed to do? You're supposed to be there. Talk to the so That's really fucking fantastic of you. After spending two months in prison, Pete Burns was sent to Plymouth, where he was ordered to live with the fan responsible for bailing him out. But in desperate need of some medical attention, Pete has been allowed back in London permanently, where he makes straight for his cosmetic surgeon. At the back entrance. <laughs> Basically, I've been, to say, a bachelor of the cosmetic surgery field, and it wasn't a matter of uh, vanity, it was a matter of sanity. Give me a big smile. I'm going to see where there's wrinkle lines on there, you know. I felt I hadn't been born in the body or the face or the physical being that I guess my spirit should have been in. Just relax, 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 relax. I took the first step just before spin me, so it'd be an 84, which was the nose. And that was a few jobs. Okay, now look up for me. Up. It was like doing a building, you know, you do a little bit at a time, and then just, just by some miracle, it's like, right, that's it, that's fine. That's exactly how I want to be. This is where it stops. Five. Five. Somewhere down the line, not that long before I met Michael, I suddenly, I remember waking up one morning and I really knew myself. I was very comfortable in my skin. You see, I don't think anybody in the public eye would allow this to be filmed, and it's my statement. I'd rather go through two hours of pain and then have 18 months of self-satisfaction and walk around thinking, if only, if only, but I haven't got the courage. What I need you to do is, I want you to... <laughs> <laughs> because it paralyzes your face and you go like Betty Davis after the stroke. But Pete's need for surgery came at a high price. I did a show with the Scissor Sisters and I woke up the next day and I was swollen. The pain was so bad, I phoned my doctor. He stuck a pin in the lower lip and probably drained a, a cup full of yellow fluid out of it. Pete soon discovered that he had a serious adverse reaction to a previous cosmetic procedure. We were told that Pete would have 
to have both his lips amputated, that there was nothing that could be done. The best thing to do was remove all the lip tissue, full stop. There was a plastic surgeon in Italy. He said he could fix it. He said it was like, I think he said like three operations or four operations. So with hope of a solution, Pete and Michael headed for Italy in 2004. What was meant to be a three-month stay became 17 gruelling months of endless reconstructive surgery. You know, you can romanticise and say, oh, the two of us are together in Italy, and we were there 17 months, and Michael got me through this. I was a <laughs> while I was out there, because I was, I was half stoned most of the time on drugs that weren't agreeing with me. I was getting two anaesthesias a week, usually. I was on all kinds of painkillers. It all, it all plays with your mind, doesn't it? Pete finally makes it back to his home in fashionable Notting Hill. But these days, the house is more of a shell than the home of a pop star. I've lived in this house for probably about 20 years, and it's currently in the process of being sold. And it's kind of really weird coming back here after being in jail <laughs> and in Plymouth. Um, it's no longer a home, so if I had to leave it right now, I'd just be leaving a squat, you know. And I'd, this is the house, this is the living room. And um, my cats are pigs. And this is the only way my cats can eat, in that they can dig their nose into a utensil. We never did any structural alteration on the house, but I can only gather that it was designed specifically for a pygmy from Papua New Guinea, because I can't even fit my ass in that bag. This is the house of fucking stairs. This was the nicest room on the plan for this, as this was the room that I most wanted to live in, but we would have had to knock that wall out. Sometimes we get builders in to try and renovate the house, and for reasons best known to themselves, they'd flee the house in the middle of the job. It's two weeks on, and Pete's due in court, but Steve, Pete's bandmate, is already running late. I don't know, I'm sure court starts at half past nine. Does it not start half past nine? Is Steve away? I'm not calling. I should call him. Ask me a question, I'm not awake. Hi, I've lost an arm. I'm a little sorry for me in course. I'm a paraplegic. Pete's <laughs> all ready to go. I don't know what time he's meant to be there for. For ten. So you're going to come around here? You can have your cigarette. I said I'm going to go out for once. You're not going to make it. You're not going to go to court. Do you want to speak to Pete? You can't be fucking serious. Drunk again. You're not going to make it. <laughs> Sorry. What am I supposed to do? You're supposed to be there. Talk to us, Lester. That's really fucking fantastic of you. Right now. But what did you say? You're not going to make it. Okay, hurry up then, sir. I can't be late. So many times it's just been impossible for me to actually get somewhere because somebody else has been unconscious due to a massive intake of benzodiazepines and alcohol, and yet I'm the one with the problem. It's kind of an important day, and if you're late, it looks bad on you again, and it's not your fault. And where are you? Okay, can you hurry up, because if I'm late, it's going to call. Okay, then bye. I feel surreal. What the fuck's going on? I don't know if I'll go back to jail or not. I'm trying to conceal items of makeup in my anus. Not really, but you know, I'm thinking I'm going to get a left pencil into jail. Hey, Steve. Oh, there we oh, go. Oh, brought his own limo driver. I hope I look suitably disrespectful for calls. <laughs> Bye. Because of his previous involvement in the case, Michael must stay at home and wait for news. Oh, fuck off. Who's he? Is that Papi? Tell Michael to draw the curtains, he's got no clothes on. I don't care how many photographers wait outside. Yeah, I occasionally like to punch one in the head because I just want to make him think about, well, well, why the fuck are you waiting there in the rain? What do you think you're going to get? But I understand they're going to be there, and I don't care if they get me coming out of the house in a pair of underpants with a bin liner full of cat shit. Who cares? I feel like a pinball for the past four years. I feel like I've been flicked from one situation to the other, and I rolled with it, and, and now I, I, I can't do it anymore, or it's going to explode in everyone's face, and I'll end up in a psychiatric institution. Pete's pre-trial hearing will determine the charges he'll face in a few weeks' time, so he'll need to make a good impression. Bullshit. That's how it's going. 
Pete. No. Bullshit. That's how it's going. Pete not been lucky, and he doesn't handle the unluckiness all that well, and undoubtedly he can be his own worst enemy. Because Pete arrived two hours late, the judges now postponed the trial for a further two months. I see Hunt on his side, it was hilarious. <laughs> what you doing for? Hi, Hunt. It was just a farce, they were furious that I was so late. That got it off on a bad foot. Aside from upsetting the judge, Peter's also learned that Michael's previous witness statement is now being used as the key piece of evidence against his case. And it's not that I'm angry with you, but your statement was the one that tipped the whole case. Yours is the biggest statement, but that's by the by. That's the way they've handled it. So consequently, you've withdrawn your statement and the CPS haven't acted on it. It's a comedy of errors. It's just to do with the restaurant I used to work in, and Pete went in there and, you know, his behaviour was perceived to be threatening. I don't think there are many couples that have been together with the intensity that we have, where he hasn't ended up with a, a, a punch in the face at some point. That's just my idea of romance. I think anyone who imagines that there's a pussycat underneath the iron uh, is wrong, uh, which is not to say that he's not sensitive but he's a tough cookie, and he's had to be. Basically, a lot of celebrities now in this country are getting away with a lot of things, and you've got a minor allegation against you, and you're being made an example of in a way. I think the basis of police stations is they sit on duty all night and they watch programs like Big Brother and they make assumptions about you as a character. Oh, come on, that situation with the fur coat, was that not a taste of things to come? Who the fuck gets a fur coat seized by the police? Pete's wardrobe is obviously vast and he'd be lost without his expensive, gorgeous clothes and it takes a lot of money to look like Pete. But Pete doesn't have a lot of money now. With mounting legal bills and the cost of surgery, Pete's having to find new ways to raise cash. When times got tough, it was desperate measures. He had to sell his designer clothes. A girl's got to do what a girl's got to do. We just didn't have any choice. It beats going around trying to get a job, doesn't it? You can sell a load of clothes, get enough money to sift through more bills, and then uh, sell some more. So this is just kind of expensive crap, really. People might look at this and think it's a silly old thing, but it's by a designer called um, Stephen Sprouse, who's dead now. The things with all these big graffiti letters on a hugely collectible. He did a tour in the 80s. I don't know the name of it, but these were really famous. These were part of the tour. They're on one of his videos. Vivian Westwood things just kind of thrown in a big lump. This is a coat by a guy called Lee Bowery. Apparently there's only two of them. One for Pete and one for Holly Johnson. Oh, is the pins. It's so heavy, it's unbelievable. One of the patches is somewhere, actually, you know, from the spin me. That was just chucked in a bag. It's worth a fortune. But you can imagine how much this would be worth to people that... <laughs> but you get the idea. This is the spin me dressing gown with all the big things on it. It's a bit lived in. <laughs> and these magazines, even, a lot of them are first copies, so they're worth a lot of money. That's the problem in this place. Even if you think it's rubbish, it's probably the first one. So it's expensive rubbish, so you can't... You end up not being able to throw anything. We've got so much more than this. Loads more. It could fill this place three times over. With Pete back from his disastrous court appearance, he's been ordered to wear a tagging device and follow a strict 10pm to 6am curfew. Done. More or less. So there's a lot of people out there wearing these. I'm not alone in the world. Oh, God. Well, we've got 80,000 in our region. Shit, so part of a tag support team. <laughs> the thing hurt my ankle. It was uncomfortable. I had to walk around with it on. I didn't think it was a camp accessory. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Hi. Determined not to let the tag weigh him down, Pete calls a meeting with his PR managers to get his career back on track. 
I just need to know what the situation is. When can you work or? Well, I can work, yeah, but I'm not allowed out after 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, well, you won't be doing anything after 10 o'clock at night. So you're basically going to be tagged until September on a, cur a curfew, is that right? Yeah, and I'm not finding that funny right now. I'm still in shock. No, but then at least you're not in Wandsworth. I just want to run all these ideas past you. And if you say, yeah, yeah fine, yeah, yeah, I'll do all those and I'll get them all sorted out for you. Right, this is quite an interesting one. OK, it's to do with the, the London Dungeons. They're running something called Freak Week. I've just been in one, okay. please. <laughs> Freak Week. They want you to be a, a judge, basically. You've got to pick out, you know, freak. who is the freak you need. And I just thought that's quite Fabulous. a fun thing to do, you know. But, I mean, there's obviously loads of interview requests for you, some of them on radio and, and stuff. But this is another interesting one. There's um, a musical in London called Gabba Gabba Hey. I don't know if anyone's <laughs> heard of it. They want you to do two shows. One show's at 3.30, one show's at 7.30 Well, they're on stage. Yeah, on stage, mm -hmm. in a musical. They've got Angie Bowie, Hugh Cole, oh, Robert Stranglers, and Tony James. Is oh, the old punk ones, I'm yeah. fine with that. Plus a young cast of new performers. Hugh Cornwall is playing Johnny Thunders. Fantastic. Uh, and basically what they want you to do is they want you to replace Hugh Cornwall because he's not going to be in there for and those two days. Johnny Thunders. Well, you'll be yeah. Johnny Thunders, yeah. When I'm working, there is a certain craziness about me. I recently heard that somebody who worked with me said, uh, you know, oh, Pete was really crazy at that time. I think, you're lying, bitch. I wasn't crazy at that time. I was just working. Yeah. 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 Everything can be perceived as crazy. It's not all crazy. Some of it's me, some of it's madness. It's four weeks later, and there's trouble at home. Michael is on the phone to Pete's solicitor. Well, they can force their way in. Well, they can just say, just go now, even if we've got nowhere to go. Oh, that's fucking ridiculous. You can't go for housing when you're Pete Burns. How stupid is that? Do you know what I mean? It's bollocks. It just doesn't... The same rules don't apply. It's just not possible. The latest today is because there's a bankruptcy order against the house and also a repossession order. And we've had an eviction notice to be evicted on Monday, which they more than likely will. We'll just have to shut the curtains and do our usual <laughs> behind the couch. Had to sell my catalogue because of tax problems. We didn't pay tax for years. I don't think I'm the only artist that's ever had to do it. But I can always remember seeing the other casualties, the 80s, and, you know, seeing them go down the plug hole and thinking, well, I'm all right, I've always got that catalogue. But it had to go or the tax was going to take the house from under us. More than likely, yeah. Uh, you serious? No, Pete, I'm joking. Of course I'm serious. Have you got a colostomy bag? You know, I don't care if we have anywhere to stay initially or anything to take with us, but if you're thrown out of here and it gets to the evening, your tagging device isn't in operation and go back to jail. It's that simple, Pete. It's not funny. I'm not thinking it's yeah. funny. What we're supposed to do, lie on the floor? And... Nothing we can do, because, again, it's been left too late. Honestly, we're at a point where we just feel like running away. We really do, because the problems are insurmountable. And he's well, they're not insurmountable. Well, I think they are. I was getting a lot of letters in Wandsworth, and, you know, everyone's saying, oh, you're really, really strong. Keep fighting, keep fighting. And I think that's the misconception people have about me. I realise that I'm actually really quite fragile. I don't want car crash TV. I don't want people to know that I fell to pieces. There's a lot about me I don't want people to know, but it's out there in the in the public domain and there's rumor there's lies there's speculation and there's there's truth coming up can pete and michael stave off eviction today i just like lying on the floor and screaming and this is supposed to be a documentary that shows the transformation to triumph Pete Burns has been living under the threat of bankruptcy for months. But just when it looked like he was going to lose his house, good news arrives. We didn't get evicted, we sold the house. And as hellish as it was, and as relieved as I am that it sold because we needed it to, I'm kind of really sad too. Because it was ours and it was our home and it's full of memories. You kidding me? You've got to take the middle off to get to the box. So it's practically impossible? Um, I would say so. Bye bye, Mira. <laughs> The important thing, laptop, electricals, champagne. This is like the heaviest bag in the history of heavy bags. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.
buy house. It's a stepping stone into... <laughs> buy house. It's a stepping stone into a different life. You know, it's not the end, it's just a beginning, and it's a really good one. Hi, flat. Be a happy home. I'm just waiting for the kettle, because I'm gagging for a coffee. I'm waiting for the loo roll, because I'm gagging for a shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then, disaster strikes. Pete's lost his makeup bag. Am I just left at the house? This is what I said to take with you the things that mattered, so then you didn't lose them. There were a million other things to look okay. at. It's just like a silver carrier bag thing, and it's got like a Louis Vuitton makeup bag in and stuff like that. And when you drive me back to the house, I've got to get that bag. Oh, please, God, let it be there. Makeup crisis. You wouldn't have put it inside one, would you? No, no. If I forget a damn thing. There's no way they'd have lost anything, is there? Oh, this is a real drama. No foundation, no powder, no eyebrow pencils, no mascara. I'm angry now because he's got coffee and he doesn't care about my face. I love him to death, but... I mean, I'm really high maintenance and it's ridiculous. I'm going to have to hug. No sign of that bag yet? No. But you've definitely looked in the cupboard in the dressing room. Definitely. It's not here. I've no idea, Pete. I really don't know. Well, the bag completely disappeared. We'll have to go through every single fucking bag just to find your makeup. I just remember when I got back to the flat and Michael just had the living room sorted out and it was like, oh, God, he's done all this and I've been running around looking for a lipstick. And with just days to go before the trial that could have landed him back in prison, Pete gets more good news. Key witnesses withdraw their statements, so the courts drop the case. I shamed myself and behaved abhorrently and I'm sorry if I caused anybody who didn't deserve it great distress. And what am I left to do with now but say I'm sorry? It's kind of not enough. I'm carrying my bladder in this bag. I need to piss so badly I could die. You know what I'm What if he's not in? I'm going to... Hello. Oh, he's in. Oh, hi, he's hi. Here. With things Hello. finally looking up for Pete, he's now determined to get his career back on track. I never think anything I've achieved is any good. And I've got a, 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 as age sets in, which it is rapidly, oh, me, me. <laughs> you know, I've got to accept that I'm always going to criticise what I do. I never think anything's good enough, but there's a point where I give up. I've just got to persevere, really. But this is tough, going in, recording new material. I'm trying to throw myself in to things. Who knows, it might backfire. I burned down cities and I crashed a plane. Behaved in ways I won't again But nothing got me what I need Well, I don't want this programme to come across as depressing and, you know, there's the casualty of Big Brother. That, that's not the case. I'm a casualty of myself and my own standards and my own, my own sometimes aimless ambition. It's all done with glow. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I don't feel I've given anything that I would really like the British public to judge me by forever. This is just a phase in time that's being captured on camera. You know, Pete does what he does. He'd be doing it if he wasn't famous. It's, you know, it's a byproduct of his life, of his nature. Now, is that courageous or is that just somebody being themselves? There's always a market for an anti-hero. Pete fits that quite well because he doesn't fit any norms. He's not afraid or frightened to speak his mind, whoever it upsets. I mean, I have always been in love with Pete Burns. I mean, there's no question. I've always loved him as a human being. Um, and I've gone through some incredibly difficult times with him. But that's talented people. If I'm going too fast for you... No, 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 no. It's just a case of being tripolar. <laughs> <laughs> I'll achieve something great before I'm in the soil. And that might not be a number one record or, you know, a gig to 750,000 people. It might be something completely different. OK, audience, I'm really out of tune, but it's perfect in my head. <laughs>
I hope he does go on and just become a very grumpy old Barbie doll lookalike. It'd be fantastic to see him in, a, in 20 years time still tottering around on his massive heels, shouting at people in the street and still keeping on going and being the big old eccentric that we love him for. Okay, so to me, it's made big progress and I'm not ready to slash my wrists. Quite yes. <laughs> Quite yes. Even though it might make good TV. You should let me be his manager. I'll put him right back up where he belongs. <laughs>